we have that the GCD of A and B, and the way that we would find this the hard way, in other words, kind of like the long way, is that whole A needs to be broke up into its prime factors. B needs to be broke up into its prime factors. And we factor to the primes. And then the GCD, once you have that, is just going to be the primes. But which ones do you pick? For the GCD, you'll pick which of the prime factors, the larger or the smaller? The smaller. The, smaller. Uh, the thing to think about here would be, is the GCD smaller than A and B? Yeah, because it's the thing that divides them both. So it's smaller, so let's go ahead and take the smaller. So that would be the min of A1 and B1, and P2 would be the min of A2 and B2, and then PK would be and then the min of AK and BK, right? But on the other hand, factoring is computationally very expensive. The reason why is if you want to factor something, you have to go ahead and check the primes. Now, we don't have to check all of them, right? So if I was trying to factor a number around the size of 100, I could immediately find one of the possible prime factors by only checking the what? The things less than 10. So you only need to check the primes up to the square root. So if you're at a million and you want to factor it, you need to take all the primes between two and a thousand, right? Because the square root of a million is a thousand. So I need to check all of those primes to see if they divide it. And if none of them divide it, then whatever number you were dealing with was prime. If it, one of them divides, you've made it smaller, we found one of the factors, and then you keep factoring the leftovers. And that's how you do the prime tree. Uh, the reason why this is computationally expensive is Let's say I need to check all. I need to check the primes from two to a thousand. If I would like to say, please factor one million two hundred fifty-five thousand one hundred and twenty-three. I say, please factor that. And you would say, well, I'm just going to have to check two. I'm going to have to check three. I'm going to check five. I'm going to check seven. I'm going to check eleven. I'm going to check thirteen. And we just got to do. It. And the problem is, if two doesn't work, what does it tell you about the rest of the primes to check? Nothing. If three doesn't work, what do you have to do? Move on to five. In other words, you have to check them all. And that's the, that's the difficulty of factoring. If something, if you check to see if two is one of its factors and the answer was no, I just learned that two wasn't a factor. I've learned absolutely nothing else. So if I have to check a million primes, worst case scenario, it's the last prime you check, right? You gotta just go through them all. And so factoring is a very expensive process. It just simply takes you time. Is there a faster way to do this? Well, what we're going to notice is the following. If I was trying to find the GCD of A and B, and I took the bigger number, let's say A was the bigger number, and I wrote this as QB plus R, right? That's just the, the sharing algorithm, it's the division algorithm. And I would say, okay, what is A? It's so many Bs plus R. And we can find the div and the mod, that's not very expensive. So Q is the div and R is the mod. What do I know about the size of R? What's the largest R can possibly be? Let's say I was trying to find the GCD between 123 and 99. If I would write it in this, this form, right, R, if I take 123 divided by 99, what's the largest remainder you can have? 98. 98, right? Because if I have more than that, I would share, right? So R is always smaller than B. And if A is big, right, well, B and R will be smaller than A, and R is smaller than B. But if I would look at this particular thing, this is something we know. R is greater than or equal to zero, yet strictly less than B. It's not B, it's smaller than B. If I want to write it as an equal to, equal to B minus one. So that's in that range. Now, if I look at this, 
if a number divides B and R, if you could find some sort of special number in terms of divisibility, if a number would divide B and the number would divide R, what would that tell you about that number dividing A? If you can break up this number evenly and break up this number evenly, we have a theorem. Any combination of those two can be broken up. What's A? It's a combination of B and R. Since A is a combination of B and R, we have that nice theorem that simply says that number divides A. It must divide A. Um, let's take that thing and let's put the QB to the other side. A minus QB is equal to R. Right? That's just all the remainder is. If you want to find remainders, how can you find remainders? Take the A minus the div of B, and that tells you what's left over. You just subtract. Rather easy to find. But this also tells us something. If a number divides A and B, then the number divides R. Seem to make sense. Well, now this kind of is an if and only if. It says, all right, wait a second. If a number divides a, B and R, that means it must divide A. But since it already divided R, I could kind of like kind of put in parentheses over here and say, uh, yeah, and R, because I already knew that, right? Sorry, not R. I want to talk about B and B. And if it divides R, but then I also could say that it's still going to divide B, right? So we have a biconditional. If you can have something that divides B and R, it has to divide A and B. If you had something that divides A and B, it must divide B and R. So that talks about any type of divisibility. If I was looking for the biggest number possible, I can have lots of numbers that do this. I have a number that divides B and R. Well, that, that number is going to divide A and B as well. Well, I have another divide A and B. That's also going to divide B and R. And so this becomes an if and only if statement, right? So these together, this says uh, let's make our number, let's call this D. D divides A and D divides B if and only if D divides B and D divides R. That's my number. I'm just going to call my number D. Anything that divides A and B must divide B and R. It's logically equivalent. And that says any D. So if it works for any D, I can use universal instantiation. Anything that divides A and B must divide B and R. Anything? Yeah, anything that divides. What about the biggest? Yeah, I said anything. So I can pick a specific example, and that would tell me that the GCD of A and B must be equal to the GCD of B and R. Now, why would this be important? Well, do you find it very difficult to write problems? Like if I asked you to find A, the GCD in A and B, do you find the div and the mod hard to find? No. Div and mods are easy to find. They're not computationally expensive. And this says that the GCD of A and B is the same thing as the GCD of B and R. Well, GCDs are difficult if I have big numbers. But if A is big and B is a bit smaller, but what about B and R? It's gone from larger numbers down to smaller numbers. 
say example. If I ask you to find what is the GCD of 25 and 15, and you don't want to do any factoring to figure this out. Say, oh, that's too hard for me to find. These numbers are too big. So I just simply do this. 25 is 115 plus what? 10. So it says, fine, don't find the GCD of 25 and 15. Find the GCD of 15 and 10. Oh, that's too hard for me to find. Those numbers are too big. Okay, fine. 15 is 1. 10 plus 5, right? That's just the division algorithm. And so that would tell me that this, is, this has to be equal to the GCD of 10 and 5. Oh, that's still too hard for me to do, even though I know what it is. Oh, that's still too hard for me to do. Fine. 10 is 2 5s plus nothing left over. What does a remainder of zero tell you? It divides, right? It literally divides it. So what would that tell you the common divisor must be? Five, right? It has to be five, which by the way, happened to be the number up above. And so this is simply five. No factoring required. All I'm asking for is you go through this entire process and you ask, okay, I don't want to do 25 and 15. It's too hard. Okay, fine. 25 is so many 15s in a remainder. Well, that would mean that, notice how the pattern works. I then take the GCD of the smaller number and then the remainder. Well, that's too hard. Let's write it again. And you just go through this process until you get zero left over, but zero left over tells you the number you just had has to have been the GCD because it divides it. It's a notice. Is 5 a factor of 10? Yes, because remainder was 0. So the answer had to have been 5. Let's try another one. What would be the GCD of 51 and 22? I could factor 22. I could factor 51, do all this work, and say, I don't want to do that. Okay, fine. 51 is how many 22s? It's two 22s with what left over? Seven. And so this has now been reduced to the GCD of what? 22 and seven. Well, I don't want to do that. That's too hard for me to figure out. Fine. 22 is three sevens plus one. which means now I'm not working with the GCD of 22 and 7. This has been reduced to the GCD of 7 and 1, which is going to be 7 is 7 ones plus 0, which obviously means the answer had to have been 1. If you look at it, what's the greatest common divisor of 7 and 1? Well, 1. 1 for all. That's the only way to do for both of those. And so that's equal to 1. So therefore, this had to have been 1. A lot faster than factoring. This particular technique, this here, is called Euclid's algorithm. So Euclid's algorithm, if you look at this, notice what do we do? We say that the GCD of two numbers is the GCD of <coughs> the second number, and then the mod. But what's that? The GCD of the second number and the mod. But what's that? The GCD of the second number and the mod. In other words, this is a perfect programming example to do re self-recursion. A GCD function that calls itself. But then the programming language has to have the ability to do recursion, which does its own subtraining, which is it does, has to have the ability to do its own memory management or else this thing's going to fail in a spectacular fashion. Because what do you have to do? Well, it's like, well, I'm going to take the GCD of 25 and 15. Well, that means I need to 
save that and make a branch and create a new memory space so I can take the GCD of 15 and 10. But I don't know that. All right, I need to save that and create a new memory space. And so you just do copy, 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 copy. And if this goes too deep, if it branches out too much, it'll just use all the memory in the system. So there's usually recursion deaths, like 500 or something like that, before it'll blow up in terms of the language. And what you do is you just keep doing self-recursion until you get a remainder of zero, and then the previous remainder had to have been the answer, is the answer. 